in 2018, we had 50,379 initiates. And uh, some have been asking us how many people died. And our answer was a very big none of the 50,379 died. All of them came back. We have observed over time that there is a flooding of boys from the initiation school to the hospitals. So we are actually trying to prevent that because hospitals are not meant to accommodate initiates. In, 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 in fact, we are trying to say a rescue center is, is, the, is, the, is the cross between initiation school and the hospital. Now if you go and open an <coughs> illegal school from where I'm sitting and somebody dies, or somebody gets traumatic amputation, you are calling for me. I will be joining that particular case to make sure that you get the hash hashest and even assist the family member to sue you for what you have done because you have done it illegal. So male circumcision, which is practiced for social, cultural or medical reasons, is one of the oldest and most common surgical procedures performed globally. It is estimated that one in three males worldwide are circumcised. Now, here at home, some will have their foreskin sniffed off, or snipped off, sorry, some, sometime after, soon after birth, or some in childhood, uh, some in their teen years, either in hospital or in doctor's rooms, uh, or in the mountains, as some said, and in fact, for some, in their adulthood. Now, there are mainly two ways in which male circumcision takes place. The one is through male medical circumcision, and the other one as part of the traditional practice of rite of passage into manhood. Now the interest in male circumcision over the years has been mainly for two reasons. One is the role that circumcision plays in HIV prevention, and the other one is the unfortunate severe complication and in some instances death associated with the traditional circum circumcision. So our topic today is male circumcision. And our guests include a senior uh, consultant uh, urology from the department urology department at Chris Baragona, Chris Hani Baragona Hospital and then we also have the national MMC uh, program manager from the National Department of Health and then we have the um, chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders and then we also have somebody who has been medically circumcised to share his uh, experience with us and of course we have one of the doctors that takes part in the MMC program. So be part of the show by asking the panel some questions or simply just sharing your views with us. The number to call is 714-5861 or 5877. Now, you can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. So sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show coming to you just after a short break. I'm Dr. Silo Mattel, and this is Health Talk. doesn't get better than this. Speco. What's the point of a tasty breakfast if your body can't benefit from it? ProNutro is the original protein cereal containing balanced proteins that your body can absorb and use so you can enjoy all the best things the day has to offer. ProNutro. Protein to support your body. Men and boys from Delft and Balha have heeded the call to man up, with many registering for the free medical male circumcision service. It's good for men's health, and um, I think it's healthy. 
I must admit though, I, I'm a bit scared, you know. <laughs> and of course, you know, I've, you've always heard stories, it's this and that, and it's painful and all that. But I've decided today, me and my son actually. Experts say circumcision reduces the risk of HIV infection by at least 60%. As part of the campaign, men are also screened for other health-related issues. There were three randomized control trials that were conducted in Africa, one here in South Africa, one in Kenya, and one in Uganda, that demonstrated almost 10 years ago now this protective effect of at least 60%. These studies actually went on and have continued to follow that group of people and are finding that actually the protection rates are often over 70%. So it is the most effective one-time decision that a man can make to protect himself against HIV. Campaign managers say it's been a success, but KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape, Cape Town in particular, have experienced a slow uptake of the service. It's been very challenging in the Western Cape to get guys to circumcise, and partly because some of them see it as a cultural thing, so they attach the tradition to that, and they see it as not something that they have to do themselves, but it's part of the, the rite of passage. The three-bed mobile unit can accommodate up to 40 procedures daily. Clients are advised to either report back to the mobile unit or nearest healthcare facility for a checkup 48 hours after the procedure. Dwight Levitt was among the first men who underwent the procedure. Like the saying goes, cleanliness is next to godliness, and that's the way to go to prevent STIs or HIV, anything. Yes, that's my main point. It's 15 to 20 minutes, and it's no pain. No pain. It's just an injection, maybe. But for me, no pain. A drifting duo comprising iconic Cape Town DJ Reddy D lured many passers by to the event. Vanessa Puna, SABC News, Belha. All right, so let's talk about this concept of male circumcision. It's a pleasure to welcome our guest. First is Dr. Robin Friedman, who's a senior consultant based at the urology department at Chris Honey Baragonath Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk. Morning, sir. Thank you. Right. And then, of course, we have uh, Diane Loy, for short, who is the program manager, MMC, from the National Department of Health. Welcome to Health Talk, Diane. Thank you, sir. Right. Last but certainly not least is Nkosi Mashangu, who is chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders. Welcome to Health Talk, Nkosi. Uh, thank you. And good morning. All right. So perhaps let's, let's start by, by looking at... Just a few things. I mean, I think everybody knows what circumcision is. Uh, uh, let's look at the history and the patterns of circumcision. Perhaps you want to, to perhaps start by um, making a comment there? Look, as, as far as we know, circumcision probably goes back to ancient Egypt, about 15,000 years, yeah. as far as we know. Mm -hmm. um, it's been done for multiple reasons across the world in different cultures. Right. Um, and those reasons vary according to different cultures. Um, it's often done for religious reasons, particularly in Muslim communities, Jewish communities. Um, it can be done for cultural reasons, as yeah. you mentioned earlier, particularly as a right to, to adulthood, yeah. um, a passage to adulthood. Um, often we do it for medical reasons. Um, and that's where this discussion comes in over uh, STD prevention, HIV prevention, yeah. um, but many other medical reasons that we can do it for as well. Okay. Um, we're going to come back to, to, to that. Yeah. But perhaps let, let me start off by, or at least speak to Diana. Diana, you're the program manager for, for the MMC. Just, just take us briefly through this program, when it started, why it started, who's funding you, and so on. So in, in 2007, uh, there was a call by WHO, the World Health Organization, right. and the Joint United Program for HIV and AIDS, that's UN AIDS, that all countries with a high prevalence of HIV and low prevalence of circumcision mm -hmm. should adopt uh, medical male circumcision as an HIV prevention strategy, but not a standalone, but in combination prevention, yeah. you know, an add-on methodology. So in, in 2009, uh, we, we, we took the the stance of preparing uh, uh, medical guidelines uh, and strategies including the service delivery side and the uh, demand creation side. Uh, we um, then set targets to look at 80% coverage of the male population uh, of the sexually active group 15 to 49. In, uh, in 2010, uh, with the help of uh, the president, the then president, we launched the HCT campaign and in line with the campaign we launched medical male circumcision mm -hmm. um, as an HIV prevention strategy but in combination with other uh, pre uh, prevention strategies. So do you have targets and, and how are you doing in terms of the targets? So our targets as part of the um, 
the 80 percent coverage when we started was 4.3 million circumcisions. Mm. Uh, it was very difficult to get to the target because uh, you heard of um, you know poor male seeking um, uh, health behaviors and uh, men didn't know about this this intervention and it, it was a task for us to to get out there and, and get as many men for circumcision. But to date we have done um, oh, just over 4 million circumcisions uh, as of the end of May uh, for the program. And uh, we are seeing what modeling uh, studies that we have done and that we have now really um, had an impact on the epidemic uh, by at least preventing uh, close to 100,000 new infections right. in the community. Okay. Let's speak to Ngoz because um, the perhaps just Take us through the National House of Traditional Leaders, you know, uh, what is its role, where is it placed, and of course we'll come into the issue of the circumcision. Yeah? No, thank you. I think uh, the National House um, of Traditional Leaders is more of your parliament uh, for traditional leaders. It looks at bills yeah. uh, that have an effect on culture within your rural communities, so we operate from Cape Town. and. And in Pretoria, we represent uh, the voice of rural communities. Right. We also represent uh, traditional leaders. Right. So anything that has to do with culture, we are very active uh, in that space. And I think uh, the initiation is also part of our African cultures. Right. So we are bestowed with that uh, responsibility to, to be a custodian yeah. uh, of that uh, program as, as, as the National House. And we also are supposed to come up with programs that are going to prevent um uh, deaths or yeah. if maybe a culture has to change would also lead uh, that process yeah. uh, because culture is is dynamic so it, yeah. it keeps on uh, changing so would come up with ways identify areas of culture that are in competition with uh, the constitution or that do not conform yeah. with our constitution and cultures that may be seen uh, to be harmful then we'd always have to come up with ways on how do we um, uh, make them a bit safer. All right. There's obviously challenges <coughs> everywhere, and we'll come to those and obviously the, the, the solutions. Mm -hmm. But talk about culture. C can you perhaps then take us through this culture of you know the right of passage into marriage? Because many people think of traditional circumcision as that culture essentially, and it's, it's a lot more than that. Look, I think um, the we normally look at it as initiation. Right. Uh, schools and I've always had people now talking about them as circumcision schools right. um, and they are not necessarily circumcision schools, they are initiation schools where one transcends from being a young man to being a, an adult, that's where you get to sit with elders, that's where you uh, we're able to build social cohesion where we bring a group of uh, young men that would teach each other that would know that they are within the same regiment uh, of young men. They could have an identity, you know, uh, with that regiment uh, for that year. And I think even previously, um, uh, when uh, soldiers would also come from that, because I think it also, uh, when you look at Boy Scouts and how young men are taught to persevere, to be able to face hardships and uh, survival skills and yeah. uh, being taught on the responsibilities that you need to have as a young as, as a young man yeah. you know initially what used to happen is that immediately after having gone through initiation then we'd be expected to to get married right. you know uh, but but lately because i mean culture as we're saying culture is dynamic right. there's a lot of different uh, communities that are influencing how people do uh, their cultures. You don't see young people getting married. They get married. Yeah. And uh, how, how and, long and, uh, is, is this uh, initiation period? Is it look, I think it, it varies from um, um, a commun from one community to the other. Right. Uh, initially, what used to happen, I think there was a process where I think for a year or so, yeah. a boy would go through a process of being prepared right. uh, You know, to go to initiation. There are things that he shouldn't eat. There are things that he shouldn't do. You know, there's behaviors that... Uh, is expected of him before he goes to initiation. Right. So, but now because uh, you have school, you have all these things uh, that are affecting that period of preparing this uh, young man, it, 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 it changes. You know, yeah. so in other cultures, it's two months, uh, other areas, it's a month. So now we are trying to conform yeah. with the law as well and also adapt to the current 
uh, environment that we find ourselves in that you know you need to be uh, you know following times right. uh, we, we, know. we're gonna talk a little more about that let's just take a call i think we have victoria from melorado park victoria welcome yes good morning morning victoria yes um i'm watching the show now uh, uh while you're talking there um i think it's a good thing now since uh, we are scared to take our children to the mountains now for circumcised to be men yes there is power because when you look at the news and then <clears throat> yeah. So I think it's a good thing because now my first son did it so bad. And the second one, the, here around in the community, there's this uh, organization in Gangbana from here to the place where they do the circumcision. My right. son is only 10. I think he's turning 11 this year. Right. So they went with the kumbi and come back. But I think it's, it's going to be a good thing for, for Hori. Baba Ruto Hori. They're doing circumcision for one, two, three, because now they just go and say, hey, we're coming back. And then when they come back, they're so excited. Yeah. They're even inviting each other All right. because they don't know what's happening yeah. okay. and what is it for. Thank you for your contribution, Victoria, essentially saying that I mean, she, she, parents are often scared mm -hmm. to send their children to the mountains uh, as part of a culture, you know, um, uh, for circumcision. And uh, she, she's glad that we're talking about this clearly. Uh, talking, looking at how we can make this practice safer. We don't have time, unfortunately, but I wanted to just get back to that issue of the medical indications for circumcision, but we'll talk about that when we talk about MMC. Time for a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion on circumcision. Please stay with us. Trans Travel is your ultimate hookup on all things art, entertainment, travel, and lifestyle. So be sure not to miss Trans Travel every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. It is estimated that about 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't been created yet. On Network, we don't shy away from having these conversations. Nothing wrong with wanting to be a doctor, nothing wrong with wanting to be a lawyer, but we're talking digital skills. We do coding, we do computer literacy. Beyond what you know, here's what else you can actually look into as a career. If South Africa invests properly in tech, you know, it could be the next China. Be a part of our network, Saturdays at 8.30 p.m. The majority of male circumcisions worldwide are performed for religious or traditional reasons. Such procedures generally take place outside of formal medical settings and are performed by providers who may have special training but who are normally not health professionals. One person that went and did it traditionally was Linda Mtimunye from Sekunda in Pumalanga. Linda understands the importance of circumcision. Circumcision is good for every man because, uh, uh, because the foreskin is storing too much dead inside your penis. But if, if, if you circumcise, it's all, always clean. It doesn't have that fatty stuff which can uh, be infectious at some stage. Linda chose to get circumcised traditionally because for him as a Ndebele man, he saw fit that he needs to respect his culture. Uh, it was part of my culture because I'm proud of my culture. I'm, pr I'm proud of being Ndebele. So I went to the initiation school to, to honor my culture. In some cases, traditional male circumcision had an increased risk for complications. Thus the Ndebele people first consult with a medical doctor to check their health before summoning to the mountains. That is according to Mr. Mtimuni. Before you go to the initiation school, you, are, you went to the doctor to be checked because you want to know if you'll be able to, uh, to be well in terms of uh, your health 
and secondly to know that because you know you'll not be staying in a comfortable uh, home in a comfortable environment because you are going to be taught certain things about, about how to be a man how to enjoy how to understand that pain is not the end of everything as seen reported on the news some boys will experience infected private parts excessive bleeding dehydration renal failure worst case would be death and according to Mr. Mtimunye, it is because of inexperienced surgeons. People get botched because they don't know. They didn't follow the right procedures. They're just forcing things that, that is not their time to be doing uh, uh, the initiation part uh, of, of, of their culture. Mr. Mtimunye couldn't comment as to what methods or health precautions are being taken at the mountain to make sure that the process runs smooth. I'll just be honest with you, uh, culturally I can't disclose much in terms of that because it's, it's, it's for everyone to go and see and witness and have his, his, his own uh, uh, findings. But it's not a bad thing, there's nothing wrong, it all depends on the individual and the families. The elders who take you there will take care of you. Yeah. All right, so we continue our discussion on this. We still have uh, with us Dr. Robin uh, Friedman, who's a senior consultant based at the urology department at Chris, Barney, ba Chris Hani Barabana Hospital. And we still have Ikosi Masangu, who's chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders. And we're now joined by uh, Dr. Ezekiel Matebula, who's a doctor that is quite experienced in um, you know, doing these circumcisions. Welcome to her talk, uh, Dr. Matebula. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so, because we, we were talking, you know, in the last segment around, you know, um, the tradition and uh, the fact that there are sometimes challenges that we get. I think we, we touched on them uh, briefly. Um, but perhaps before we, we come to you, let, let's just take Anonymous on the line from Cape Town. Anonymous? <coughs> Anonymous, are you Hello? there? Yeah? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Please go ahead. All right, thank you. I just have two things. One, um... There is narrative that if you are circumcised, then you are almost in the clear uh, to, you know, have certain sexual relations. I mean, uh, I think that must be clarified because people are saying, now I'm circumcised, I'm, I'm clear, I can go around and see. Right. The second thing is um, I've seen a science that shows that the HIV receptors are actually on the um, skin where it is folded back after you are circumcised. Yes. So uh, there is a again, narrative that if you just insert the head, then it's okay. But as long as you don't go past the um, where the HIV receptors are, is, is that true? Okay. Well, brilliant question. We'll ask the experts. I'm not so sure. Perhaps let's give it to Dr. Friedman. Um, yeah, it's very, very important to clarify that having a circumcision has been, has been proven in multiple studies right. to reduce your risk of HIV transmission by about 60%. Right. Um, that, however, is, cannot be used alone yeah. um, because you still have another 40% chance of picking up HIV. Sure. So you still need to definitely use other methods right. to, um, to prevent HIV transmission, and the most common of using those, obviously, is condoms. Yeah. So 100%, you cannot say that just because you've had a circumcision, you will not get HIV. Right. And that strongly has to be clarified. Right. Um, with why does circumcision prevent HIV transmission? Um, there's a few theories that are going around. Um, like, the, um, like was mentioned, a lot of the HIV receptors are on the inside of the foreskin. Yeah. Um, so by removing that foreskin, we think that we can remove a lot of those receptors. Also the environment under the foreskin, um, it's a, a warm environment, what we call an anaerobic environment. We think that the HIV virus can thrive in that environment. Right. And also the inside of the foreskin is what we call a non-keratinized non area. So it's very thin, fragile skin, which can easily become abraded or damaged during right. the course of in, during intercourse, which allows the HIV virus to enter the body. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, perhaps just before, before we speak to Kosi, just take us through some of the complications that you normally see as a result of, you know, things that go wrong through uh, circumcision. 
So unfortunately, with any procedure, no matter how big or how small that procedure, there is a complication risk yeah. associated with it. Yeah. Um, with HIV, the most common ones that we see is bleeding, um, which is why it's of utmost importance that when the procedure is done, that good bleeding control is maintained. Mm. Um, if the patient should bleed afterwards, you might need to take the patient back and find the source of bleeding and correct it. The next most common one that we tend to see is infection. Mm. Um, so your post-operative care is incredibly important and the, the wound care after the procedure is very important to make sure that it does not become infected. Other complications that can come tend to become more um, or less significant afterwards. Um, there can be damage to the penis. We've seen, we've seen horrible cases where penises have been amputated or cut in half. Um, there's more longer term complications where people complain that maybe their, um, their sexual satisfaction might be decreased on a result of after a circumcision. There's many, many other complications that yeah. can occur, but the bleeding and the infection are the most common ones that we're worried about. All right. So, so and, and, and I guess let's, let's come back to that, that issue. And, and, and by the way, just to make a point, the complications that they see are not only as a result of the traditional circumcision, and, and I think we need to make that point quite, quite clear, that you know, uh, it's a surgical procedure. Even sometimes when it's done in a doctor's room, you do get these complications. Um, but, but clearly what hits the media headlines is deaths and complications associated with the tradition. What are the causes and, and why are we seeing this? Look, I think um, uh, th there's quite a number of uh, causes right. uh, for that. But what I need to state uh, before is that uh, on and about uh, 1993, I think we, I come from a community that realized that uh, the communities that we live in, with, with the young boys that we are living with, are always prone to quite a number of complications. Mm. So we needed to bring closer the medical fraternity uh, within the area of circumcision right. uh, or, 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 or initiation. So you find that in most cases, in communities where uh, the medical uh, fraternity is not too close to the situation, that's where you find the greatest number uh, of complications right. and you'd also still find that there are also complications in other areas where young initiates are denied water and uh, dehydration then becomes a, 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 a serious problem and you also right. find that parents in those communities might not be taking uh, extra care uh, because we always insist that if <clears throat> you take your boy uh, to an initiation school as a father you need to take leave and you need to be there on a full-time basis because we find that others may be suffering from chronic uh, illnesses and when they are there no one is taking care of them yeah. um, <clears throat> there would always be uh, be problems and we also find that uh, the financial uh, part is a serious problem Tell where, us about that. Where, where, uh, where i think th th there's there's too many thugs uh, uh, that have taken over uh, the, 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 the process uh, right. of initiation. I think if you look at the deaths, are mainly in illegal schools. Yeah. Because when you are going to a legal school, that legal school, the, the surgeon, whether it's a traditional surgeon or any other person, because we also work with uh, trained doctors that are performing uh, circumcisions in different uh, yeah. uh, traditional communities. Right. Uh, and you also find that the surgeons are registered, they are trained. Yeah. But if it's an illegal school, uh, all those do's and don'ts are not uh, looked into. But this seems to be a perpetual problem of illegal schools. I mean, year in, year out, you hear about all of these horrible things mm. that happen at illegal schools. Why are we not clamping down on this? Look, it's, it's, it, we, we've made a serious cry um, as, as the institution that we, you know, when you lose, sometimes you lose 50 boys in one year. I mean, that's a disaster. Mm. You know, and we sometimes feel that government as well might not be doing what they ought to be doing. Because yeah. what we are saying is that people that are opening illegal schools should be arrested for opening an illegal school. We should not wait until people die, Correct. you know, at those schools. But what happens is people are convicted and arrested after somebody has died. Yeah. So we are always uh, reacting. Uh, so we've been saying that there must be a directorate yeah. That is there that works on compliance on a daily basis. I'll tell you what, within the we, we're going to come back to this because yes. we, we need to talk solutions yes. going forward. Let me just briefly speak to Dr. Matabula. Uh, we heard that, you know, 
sometimes in the traditional circumcision, um, you know, there's collaboration with people like you. Can you give us your experience in terms of, you know, how you've been involved in that? Yes. Uh, in, in Limpompo, they realize that there's a lot of complications that happen in the initiation schools. Yeah. So the government decided to collaborate with uh, traditionally, uh, traditional graduates, yeah. uh, male medical doctors that have themselves gone through mm -hmm. traditional male circumcision. Right. Then we started uh, performing circumcisions. And in that year, there was a drop. It was 2014 when we started. There was a drop in a lot of deaths and yeah. other complications. And where do you perform these procedures? They are performed uh, in, right in the, in the, in the mountains. Right. Yes, yes. Right. So, but there is a pre-screening. You screen all the, the, the initiates before they go into the school right. so that you can mm -hmm. pick up those who've got chronic medical conditions and deal with those issues right. and those who've got uh, bleeding tendencies yeah. so that when you perform the circumcision, you know how to deal with each and every uh, initiate. Right. And it has, I think it has yielded good results in those areas. Right. Like mm -hmm. Ngozi is saying here that in 1993 they started in this area. I think it's working very well. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, the, so it seems like, you know, in, in a formal setting where it's a registered, you know, uh, initiation school, well, you know, um, there's not too many problems that happen there. The problem is in the illegal school. And mm -hmm. as you say, it, it, it's a police matter, really. It, it is a police matter. In fact, um, we have come up with a legislation now. In fact, there's a bill. Uh, I'm just worried that uh, it is taking too long for it to be uh, ascended into an act. The president is taking too long to sign it. Yeah. So we're hoping that it would be signed. Once it has been signed, it gives the police powers to be able to arrest uh, these people that are opening illegal schools. Because yeah. uh, if there is an Ill illegal school, there's no screening that is done there. Yeah. There's all these things that we are saying should not be done. Yeah. Are done at those illegal uh, schools, yeah. you know. And we're also calling to to parents, yeah. you know, to assist us because they are the ones that are taking those uh, kids to those illegal schools. Right. You know, we always say that if you want to know uh, and if there's a legal school, if which one is a legal school, go to a traditional leader closest to you or go to uh, contra lesser uh, people that are there in your area. Mm. But you should not just allow any other person. But we've seen uh, abductions yeah. where illegal schools, because now they are not getting uh, people coming to them, they would send out kumbis to locations and other areas and just abduct boys and yeah. take them there yeah. and demand and demand money. Yeah. So, yeah. and yeah. there's been very few arrests in those cases, yes. you know, and... People are opening up uh, illegal schools left, right, and center. There's also uh, bogus traditional leaders as well, yeah. you know, in different areas that are also issuing permits uh, illegally. So, so I think if we can now uh, start uh, being serious about this yeah. and realize that this is a serious disaster that needs extra effort uh, yeah. from us as government and from us uh, as traditional leaders, we should it's, be able it's to... It's really about it, time. Yeah. I think, you know, there's been just too many deaths and, you know, unfortunate mm -hmm. complications. But anyway, mm -hmm. time for another quick break. When we come back, we focus on male medical circumcision. Please stay with us. What I'm faced with tonight is exactly an example of what President Zuma and many others of us in South Africa have you been have faced You have to give answer for yourself. I will not allow Karl House to mislead the people of South Africa. Why are they pushing the SABC to the brink? It could be a way of punishing the SABC. To achieve this. what in the end? We can only speculate. Talk of an investigation into whether Vianney Jahana leaked his resignation letter to the media. Is that going to fall into your lap? Well, it wouldn't be. Trans Travel is your ultimate hookup on all things art, entertainment, travel, and lifestyle. So be sure not to miss Trans Travel every Saturday at 5:30 p.m.
Welcome back. We're still talking uh, male circumcision, and our guests include um, first up is Dan and Loy for short, um, who is the program manager MMC at the National Department of Health, and of course we still have Dr. Ezekiel Matebula, who is an MMC doctor who's performed quite a lot of these procedures, and we have another special guest, Richard Chikosi, who himself has undergone uh, male medical circumcision. Welcome to Health Talk. Uh, Thank you. Richard. All right, we're going to come back to you just now. Okay. Um, Dana, let's, let's come back to that issue of, uh, you know, the program in general. Mm -hmm. So clearly you need providers to help you. Um, you. You need a whole lot of doctors. I mean, judging from the statistics that you mentioned in your targets, you need a whole lot of people that assist you. Sure. How do you go through the contracting? Well, thank you for the question. So we have a plethora of uh, MMC service providers uh, providing direct service delivery uh, to, to uh, communities, and we have different service delivery models also, yeah. fixed, mobile, outreach services. Now, the way we contract um, the service providers is, uh, maybe I should talk about the pots of funding that we have. We have two pots yeah. of funding. Right. We have the one is from National Treasury, the local funding, and then we have uh, funding from uh, PEPFA yeah. um, through the U.S. government, and using that money, we uh, contract worked uh, with the um, agencies within PEFA, the CDC and USAID agencies. We contract uh, NGOs yeah. to provide service and we call them the implementing partners uh, yeah. uh, in the country and they, they uh, provide services in 27 high volume yeah. or high epidemic uh, districts. And then we, through the transversal contracting with National Treasury, uh, providing money from the HIV and AIDS conditional grant, yeah. we then also, um, through open tenders, we um, get the services of, of um, other service providers. Okay, so, so the whole point is to make it free at the point of service? Well, MMC is free at, at any point of service, okay. uh, whether it's provided by PEPFI NGOs, whether it's tra transversal contracts or RT35 yeah. contracted partners. Yeah. It's all completely free, absolutely free. There's right. no cost to the, to the client. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we, we have two callers on the line. We're going to take them one after the other. First is Bennett from Pretoria. Bennett, welcome. Hello, uh, guy. Bennett, Bennett, I think there's, a, there's an issue with your line. We're going to come back to you and see if we can sort it out. Uh, let's take Wahile on the line from Northwest. Wahile, welcome. Hello, sir. You, hi, Wahile. I'm good, thanks, myself. Good, 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 thank you. Yeah, I've got a question here. Yes. Is there any restriction to a number of operations that are to be performed per day? Because what I've realized is uh, doctors do have to operate people at uh, maybe two or three facilities, uh, whereby uh, we have a large number of kids that have been uh, coming to this operation on school holidays. Yeah. Which uh, caused at some point a problem of children not be to be prepared of what to, uh, to expect right. after this operation. Okay. So okay. now we are experiencing a problem whereby even their parents cannot uh, dress them. All right. Kids okay. are coming back to the clinic with uh, uh, swellings and such. So. Are we, are, we, are we trying to prevent uh, the thing of performing uh, a number of operations a day, trying yeah. to reach a target whilst we not, uh, out, I think it's going to cause a problem sometime. Thank, th thank you, Achil. I, I, I presume you also an MMC doctor performing these procedures. All right, let, let's give it to, to um, Dianand. Yeah. Is there a limit? Well, it, it, it depends on, on the number of teams that uh, um, an NGO has. You know, you can yeah. have uh, multiple teams that be doing circumcisions. Yeah. But, of course, it depends on the service provider also. If you have service pro provider fatigue, yeah. then you should, you should hand over to another provider. Another one. Maybe let's yeah. get it from the provider himself. Yeah? Yes. I, I think you, you need to look at the capacity first, uh, the capacity of the facility. You have facilities that have four beds, others have got uh, eight beds, others have ten. 
So the numbers will be determined by the number of beds that you have in right. a facility. Yeah. Because uh, we have low volume, which is between 0 and 30, then mid volume, which is 30 to 80, yeah. then the above 80 is high volume. So you look at the stuff because each and every bed must have a VMMC trained nurse and a, a cutter. Okay. So if, if you have so those... It's about how, how your yes. practice is structured yes. really. All right. Let's speak to, to Richard. Richard, yes. um, you, went, you underwent this procedure yourself. Yes. Just tell us about it. And in fact, tell us why you chose to go through the route of MMC versus, you know, the traditional route. Uh, uh, years ago, uh, my parents, I was staying in Petersburg. Right. So they tried to take me to do the initial school in, in Petersburg. Right. So I didn't like the idea because I was scared, in fact. Yeah. Why were you scared? Because of the deaths that were happening there right. and the stories that I heard yeah. about the initiation school. Right. So uh, early this year, I planned to take my son to do a circumcision. So the cranny took him to the circumcision uh, surgery. He didn't agree for the first attempt. Then he went for the second attempt again. He never agreed. Who uh, didn't agree? The, your child. Uh, he's he's ten years uh, ten years old. Right. Then so the cranny asked me to take him because if me if I take him he would never had a problem with that. Then when you got there he asked me that uh, daddy, you brought me here, did you do it yourself? Yeah. Then I had to be honest. I think a fair question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> then I had to be honest with him. I told him mm -hmm. that no I didn't do it. Yeah. Then he said, Oh, if you didn't do it, then I also won't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I said to him, if I do it, you won't have a problem with that. Then he said yes. Then I immediately put myself to do it. Then he said, you start first. I'll follow after you. Then they performed the surgery on me. Yeah. Then when I came out, he said, ah, dead, you are alive. You're not dead, most <laughs> then. I can do it. Okay. Then he went in and do it. So, so tell us about your experience of the procedure itself and afterwards. How long did it take you to, mm, to It's heal? less than 40 minutes yeah. and it's non-painful and it's professional and clean. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, well, well done. Well, mm. perhaps you can take us through some of the challenges that you experience, um, you know, yes, uh, doing it medically. Yes. I think medical and, and, and traditional, like we had Nkosi saying, uh, you get infections and, and bleeding. Mm. So those are the complications that you also get when you're doing it medically. Yeah. But then the challenges are when, when those clients go back to the community mm. and they don't take good care of the wound post-operatively, uh, yeah. they come back and blame the provider mm. and say, I am like this because of a provider. We, we don't take shared responsibility. Right. I think if the community can learn that after any surgical procedure, yeah. you can get an infection, yeah. there could be other complications, yeah. and we need to work together. I think that will take the program far. Great, great stuff. I think we, before we run out of time, I think let's take a last call in the segment. Tima from Dimbopo. Tima, welcome. Uh, morning. morning, sir. Yeah. Your question or comment, please? Yeah, my question is, uh, is directly to the Department of Health to check why they don't train enough uh, male nurses so that they can assist in the very same program. Yeah. Since we realized that in Mbobo, okay. the reduction of fatalities was due to the involvement of the nurses in the whole process. All right. Brilliant question. Thank you so much for that question. I think we're going to put it to you. Um, just keep that in mind. When we come back from the break, I'd, I'd like us to, to tackle that. Okay, time for another quick break. When we come back, we now wrap up our discussion and look at just how we can make this circumcision safe for everybody. Please stay with us. Must come.
character be assassinated. Mzwandile, former president uh, Jacob Zuma, doesn't believe that there was state capture. He did qualify to say his understanding may be limited. But there's lots of red on the board behind you. Is that a true reflection of what's happening on the markets today? Yeah, certainly is. It's about a tenth of a percent lower thus far for the markets uh, here locally. Your money on market sense. South Africa needs jobs. Balets Lemtetwa joins us now live. MNS attorneys were mandated to conduct these reports and investigations. What sort of processes did they follow? We heard uh, Tiamo explaining that they worked with actuarial scientists <coughs> in order to uh, investigate yeah. these transactions. Slap suits, tell us more about this. The concept of slap suits, which is a litigation often used by big companies uh, to silence critics. We as civil society won't stand for this kind of intimidation and harassment. If you come to South Africa, you need to obey the obligations that you have in terms of the laws of this country, including environmental laws. Did you know the big hole digging started in 1871 and ended on the 14th August 1914? The hole produced 2,722 kgs of diamonds. However, one diamond as huge as 490 carat of stone found in the open prior 1868 gave them the interest to dig. Extracted from 22.5 million tons of soil. Today, the hole sits at a breathtaking 214 meters deep. Kimberley Big Hole attracts tourists from all over the world, taking a vintage tram past the city, then cycling around the Big Hole. Now in 1963, Nelson Mandela, Ahmed Kathrada, Dennis Goldberg and Andrew Mlangeni were accused of treason and stood trial. We are standing in a spot with so much history. This was actually the headquarters of the South African Communist Party. The climb will be in celebration of 10 years of Nelson Mandela International Day. What lies ahead of these climbers as we live today is a big mountain. Why did you decide to be part of this initiative? The reason why I'm doing this is because I really believe in education and the doors it can open for you. So education is the gateway. Yes, actors today, the young actors, Kibo, we used to take advices from Abata uh, Alaviti. It's a rape, it's murder, it's shooting, it's killing another. I think we will be happy if the army can come in and try to patrol in and out, day shift, night shift. The South African National Defence Force will be joining police in the operations uh, following the announcement made by the police minister. It always creates a very bad perception internationally if you use an army or any defence force elements in an internal situation. You bring soldiers here, they don't have, what we call it, tiakes, rubber bullets. What they have is machine guns, and they were trained to deal with a forceful enemy. We're very keen to hear why must Zuma's character be assassinated? Mzwandile, former president uh, Jacob Zuma, doesn't believe that there was state capture. He did qualify to say his understanding may be limited. But there's lots of red on the board behind you. Is that a true reflection of what's happening on the markets today? Yeah, certainly is. It's about a tenth of a percent lower thus far for the markets uh, here locally. Your money on market sense. South Africa needs jobs. What should you do to avoid getting ill? Eat healthy, not to do drugs, not to smoke. To learn more about some of the most common illnesses and how to avoid them, join Dr. Sidlomo Daung each week and get all your health questions answered by experts. What are those signs that people should look out for and say, this is time for me to go and seek help? It is very important to identify and address those problems as early as possible. You are a fighter, you are a warrior, and you will get better. Here on Health Talk. Okay, welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. We're still discussing male circumcision. 
um, and our guests, Dr. Ezekiel Matebula in the middle, and closest to me, Dan and Loy for short. And of course, we have Gosi uh, Mashangu, who's chairperson of National House of Traditional Leaders. Before we went on the break, there was a question around um, why is the department not training more nurses so that we have more people being able to assist in, in the circumcision? Your response? Uh, thanks for the question. So we have trained uh, numerous uh, nurses to perform the, the procedure, but we have a limitation in that the South African Nursing Council mm. does not allow nurses to perform circumcision, so it's out of the scope of practice. Yeah. So therefore this, this program is doctor driven and it's assisted by nurses. Uh, nurses can, can, can do min minor surgery or, or like stitching or suturing, mm. but unfortunately they cannot do the full circumcision because it's not part of the scope of practice. Yeah. What, what's your view on that? Look, uh, we, we would say that uh, uh, the, there must be a, a big training program for traditional surgeons yeah. and also traditional nurses. Right. Because in initiation schools you have traditional nurses that are supposed to look after uh, those initiates. Right. Uh, I think uh, the doctor did uh, state earlier that with any surgical uh, uh, op uh, operation, right there would always be complications. There's a risk of complications. Right. So if we train uh, uh, traditional nurses, yeah. and we also make sure that we train uh, traditional surgeons as well. Yeah. Uh, and just, just make sure that, uh, because in, in areas where MMC is not accepted, yeah. I think there's a feeling like in the Eastern Cape that uh, it is replacing your cultural uh, mm. part. Yeah. So as long as we find a way of how do we infuse that we don't leave out uh, traditional surgeons yeah. out of what we are doing because I think people are starting to, to think that hey, mm. we've created a, a, a revenue mm. generation right. uh, for doctors. And but it's it interesting that it's, that it's not accepted. I mean, it's been proven to work in areas like Limpopo. Yes, in Bumalanga. That's what we're doing in Bumalanga. Yeah. 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 Look, it, it, in, in those areas, it has been accepted, but there are also concerns. You know, there's partnerships with your right to care and all these other organizations that are there that are doing it. Right. But the concerns yeah. is that uh, you find that um, you know people are being taken from school parents don't even know they're taken to uh, your mmc centers and so there's a lot of things that the department has to uh, investigate that are also making people a bit uh, uncomfortable yeah but we are saying that uh, during initiation yeah doctors and uh, traditional students should work uh, closer and they are working closer yeah. and we are seeing good uh, uh, you know, good results out of it. Yeah. So we should not view it as a way of removing mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the, the traditional uh, initiation part because you have had over 150,000 people that go mm -hmm. to uh, traditional initiation schools. Mm -hmm. That tells you that people still believe in this culture right. and they love it. So we, we just have to make sure that yeah. uh, all these other complications because, I mean, we have the highest rate of communicable diseases yeah. We, you know, yeah, so we are an unhealthy nation, Correct. you know, so if we are unhealthy, then it means that medical doctors have to come yeah. uh, into the space, right. you know, to make sure that, but the biggest uh, 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 solution yeah. that we need from this yeah. is that we should not only leave this to the Department of Health, yeah. uh, because the Department of Cooperative mm -hmm. Governance has to assist in terms of the pre preventative uh, measures right you know we should not be reacting because when the department of health comes in is when we are reacting yes. Uh, yes. to to what has happened uh, already dr matabula how do we we've heard that there's complications you yourself you know has mentioned the issue of complications <laughs> how do we make circumcision in general safer going forward okay i think if it it's provided by we, we stop taking our children to illegal traditional male medical circumcision sites. Mm. And we, we, we support our kids when you go to a circumcision site, come, on as, come in as a parent and understand what needs to be done post-operatively. Mm. So if we can take a role as parents in, mm. in supporting our uh, children or as wives supporting our husbands when they go and perform a circumcision, I think we can reduce a lot of complications. All right, all right. Of course. Wives may not be accepted mm -hmm. in certain fields, but uh, <laughs> perhaps your, your last few seconds in terms of how we can make MMC, you know, safer. So, currently we have uh, QA guidelines mm. to ensure that um, 
the service provision is is done within um, a, st a standard standard practice. So we have WHO standards that we follow. Uh, we do um, uh, EQA or external quality assessment visits regularly yeah. to ensure that any site in the country that is performing the circumcisions yeah. will will it's of a high standard. And then also for the for the uh, safe circumcisions in the TMI sites yeah. or the initiation sites, we we are providing funding. Yeah. Uh, from the conditional grants to the provinces that are doing traditional circumcisions, right. and we're ensuring that uh, they uh, they use this money to, as as uh, the doctor mentioned yeah. previously, to get right. uh, doctors from the traditional community yeah. to provide the services, and then we can also provide if there's uh, yeah. adverse events, yeah. we can then. <coughs> Uh, manage those AEs if we have a doctor on site. Right. I'm, afra I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. And uh, thank you so much for your for your time and contribution, thank gentlemen. You. And uh, for your, for you guys at home, thank you so much for staying with us. We we'll see you back again next week, same time, same place. I'm Dr. Sulaiman. Until then, please do take care. It's a rape, it's murderer, it's shooting, it's killing another.